So as I said, my name is Barbara Hewitt, and I am the Executive Director of the Career Services Office here at Penn. And I have a number of my colleagues joining us today. Uh, Sharon, who you just heard from, is our Senior Associate Director leading our, war our nursing team. Uh, Jamie Grant leads our engineering team. Claire Klieger leads the College of Arts and Sciences team. David Ross, he leads the Wharton undergraduate team. And Michael DeAngelis is our digital resources manager and he leads all things digital. So we're delighted to have them here. I will be giving most of the presentation, but these folks will be on the back end. Please feel free to type questions into the Q&A and they will try to answer them as we go throughout the presentation. Uh, we will also take some questions at the end uh, that might be of interest to a broader audience. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, as I mentioned, we are the Career Services Office at Penn, and our, we are centralized. We help Penn students, alumni, and postdoctoral trainees define and achieve their career goals through counseling, programs, partnerships, and other resources. We also serve to strengthen ties to Penn with our alumni, employers, and postgraduate institution. So basically, anything that would be career-related or professional development-related, we are here to help students with. And as you probably know, we are centralized. We serve all of the undergraduate students in all four schools. We also serve alumni from those schools. So students who may graduate and have uh, questions after they graduate, whether that be looking for a second job or a third job, or maybe going to graduate or professional school, we're still here. So we will be around to help students uh, while they're at Penn and also beyond that. And then you could also see we serve a significant portion of the graduate and professional student population and alumni of those programs. And we also work with postdoctoral trainees. So we have a really wide uh, group of individuals that we work with in our office. I'm going to start sort of with the elephant in the room. I wanted to talk a bit about what we've been doing since March when we went remote, much like your students uh, were remote in the spring and, and then again this fall. Uh, we quickly pivoted to help students who really had their, their life upended a bit. Many of our students may have had internships that some were rescinded or uh, perhaps they went remote. And we really wanted to serve as a resource and to put things out there that would be helpful to them. So this is just one of the things that we did in the spring. We developed a whole COVID website around resources. Things like uh, workshops on job and internship searching during COVID, which we gave live and also posted afterwards. Uh, we developed a guide to remote work, uh, how you can find those opportunities, places where you can find opportunities where you can work remotely. Uh, we did a thing called Quick Questions from Quarantine on Instagram, where students could pose a question to us, and then we would answer them later that day. So we really tried to put lots of resources at the students' fingertips. Uh, right away as soon as we knew that they needed them and, and things were quickly changing in March. Clearly, we are kind of in the same boat now, but we had a little more time to prepare over the summer, which has been great. We spent a lot of time making sure that we would be able to serve our students fully in the fall, even if we weren't able to come back, and certainly we have been able to do that. I'm going to talk broadly about the kinds of services that our office provides to your students. Uh, during a time when we are not in a pandemic, but also what we're doing now that we are uh, working remotely. So, of course, one of the most uh, prevalent things we do is provide individual advising to students, whether that be on career-related issues or going to graduate or professional school. So last year, we had uh, over 11,000 individual meetings with students. It was, you know, we, we spent a lot of time doing that. We also did uh, over 2,500 individual resume cover letters and personal statement critiques. So that is something that we do, whether we're remote or whether we are in person, it's, it's a very significant part of our work. Now we are doing that all remotely. Uh, we are using both BlueJeans and Zoom to do video conferences, and that's what most of our students are opting for. But of course, if a student wants to do one work via phone, we're happy to do that as well. I think we were all a little bit surprised in the spring that uh, once we went remote in March until the end of the year, the end of our fiscal year is June 30th, we actually saw more students in individual meetings than we did when we were on campus the year before. We had over 2,200 individual meetings with students. So clearly, uh, we adapted quickly to this virtual format, as did our students. 
And in many ways, it, that was very seamless. To complement the professional career advising that our uh, staff does, we also have a team of peer career advisors. These are students who are upper class students who have went through significant training in our office to help their fellow students with a variety of topics. Uh, they do a lot of work on resume and cover letter reviews, networking, uh, help students develop strategies around a job and internship search, and also, of course, um, resource referrals. There are lots and lots of resources that we offer to students on our website, and sometimes a little overwhelming trying to figure out which would be the best one. So our PCAs are really great at that. Um, they also do workshops for us for student groups or uh, residence halls, smaller groups where that peer-to-peer -peer interaction can be really beneficial. This year, of course, we, we have new PCAs that come in and we did the training virtually and we, they are providing virtual pop-ins, which are 20-minute video conference meetings, which your students can schedule on Handshake. And the really great thing about the PCA pop-ins is that uh, typically they're a little bit more available than the full-time appointments. We have lots of them and students can typically get in in a day or two, usually the same day, but if not the next day. Um, so it's really a nice way to augment our services and provide broader outreach to the uh, student population. I wanted to talk a little bit about our graduate and professional school advising team. Uh, they do a lot of work with students who are pre-law or perhaps uh, pre-health. Uh, they also do a lot of work with students who are thinking about a master's or a PhD, really any kind of continuing education. They also coordinate our health professions advisory board. As some of you may know who have uh, pre-med students, to apply to medical school, students will need a letter from uh, the institution that supports their candidacy. And that is something that our office is responsible for. And they spend a lot of time doing this over the summer. Uh, typically they write anywhere between two and 300 of them. And in terms of getting into medical and law school specifically, our students do really well. Um, in 2019, 76% of our seniors and alumni who applied to medical school were accepted, whereas the national average is, is just 43%. And the top three schools that they went to happened to all be in Philadelphia, but uh, of course, Penn's Perlman School of Medicine, the uh, Thomas Jefferson University, and the Lewis Katz School of, at Temple University were the top choices for our students. In terms of law school, um, between 2017 and 19, we had an average of 81% of students and alumni who applied to law school who were accepted. The national average for that is about 70%. And the top three law schools for applicants uh, just as last year was Penn, Harvard, and NYU. So our students go on to lots of different graduate programs, and certainly our office does a lot to support those in those applications. We also do, in, in addition to the one-on-one -on -one advising, we also do a lot of uh, student workshops that are more group-based. This year we are doing um, both synchronous, like this, you're logging in and, and going through it with me, but also asynchronous workshops where we either videotape and post them or perhaps we just record it through a PowerPoint presentation. The, uh, the asynchronous thing is very important this year because we have students all over the world and in different time zones. So we wanna make sure that our resources are readily available to all the students we serve. Uh, recording for um, most of those live workshops are held on the our Career Services YouTube channel, and also you can find a lot of them on our website if you look at our videos portion of that. We do hundreds of workshops every year. I just listed a few that we've held this year to give you an idea of the flavor of what we do. Um, of course, we did some how-to sorts of things this year because we are in a really uh, different environment. It's the first year we're, we are holding virtual career fairs, so we did a whole program on how to master virtual career fairs. And uh, we did one on networking during a pandemic. Uh, we do a lot of things that are industry-based. So for example, during Climate Week this year, we did a program with alumni who are working in environmental fields, uh, focused on getting started in an environmental or career, climate-related career. We do uh, lots of things for graduate school, like law school admissions, or we did pre-med at Penn, getting off to a good start for people just coming into Penn who are on the pre-med track. And then we do lots of very tailored things for specific populations. So we did a networking lab for our uh, Bachelor of Science in Nursing students. Uh, we did something recently for freshmen in engineering about what to do over their summer. 
and we did an interviewing workshop for international students. Um, there are literally hundreds of opportunities uh, for workshops on our website, and students can log in to see what might best fit their interests. We know that lots of students come to Penn and really aren't quite sure what they want to do. That's okay. <laughs> lots of us went to college and figured it out when we were there. I, I think it's a very iterative process. Um, but we do want to help students think through what might be good fits for them. So we have several career assessments that students can take advantage of. The one that we recommend students start with is this one, Career Explorer. And if, again, if they go to our website and just type in Career Explorer, they will find that resource and be able to log in to take it. Uh, it's a great uh, opportunity to answer some questions about yourself and then have occupations that might be a good fit for you to come up, and then you can explore those. We pay for this for everyone at Penn to have access to, so it's free for your student, and they can do it whenever they would like because it's all online. The other assessments I have listed here, the Strong Interest Inventory, the uh, Myers-Briggs, and Clifton Strengths, they are also available. Um, the Strong and the MBTI do require that a student meet with an advisor once they've taken it so that we can review the results for them. And there is a small fee for those other assessments because we need to pay for them separately. Um, it's like $10, it's not expensive. We also have lots of resources for students to explore what is out there in the world of work. You know, what is it like to be a lawyer or a, you know, a equities trader or a nonprofit grant writer? <laughs> There's lots of opportunities out there. So if they go to our website, they will see lots of vault career guides. This is another resource that we subscribe to that has excellent information about how to get into a variety of fields what kind of skills you would need, what kind of education, what the demand for it is uh, across a range of industries. I mentioned our YouTube channel, but we do lots of videos and career panels and industry-based things that students can take a look at there. And then, of course, whenever somebody is exploring careers, we absolutely suggest that they talk to people actually working in that field. And the QuakerNet alumni directory is a really great resource for that. Uh, so is the LinkedIn uh, alumni page for Penn. Uh, both of those could be really good ways for students to find alumni in fields of interest to them and set up an informational interview to learn more about it. We are happy to meet with students. If they're not quite sure how to do that outreach or how those resources work, they can come in and we can certainly walk them through those process because we know it can be a little intimidating to reach out to someone you don't know. But we find that Penn alums generally are really eager to talk to current students and the network uh, tends to be very strong. I'm going to transition over a little bit to our web resources. We have an amazing website. Um, we we've, we've just redid it uh, about a year and a half ago, um, and there's just tons of information on it. The first thing that I would do if you have a student who has not done this is suggest that they go into the corner where it says login. They can log in with their pen key, and they can sign up for customized newsletters. Right now, they are probably getting, if they haven't done this, a, a general newsletter that um, is based on their what the program they're in at school and their class year. But if they go in and indicate what they're interested in, in terms of industry, affinity groups, the kind of blog articles they would like, that information, they'll get a newsletter that will be tailored each Friday just with those interests. So it's a really great personalized service for them. You can also go ahead and do that if you want. You can sign up as a parent. We don't tag a lot of our context specifically for parents, but you could see things that uh, are probably more geared towards your student. But if you're interested, certainly feel free to do that. And I wanted to mention as well under the Who Are You tag, certainly under undergraduate students can log in and there's a section there that they can say they're an undergraduate student and it will take them to the main page for them. But there's also a section for parents there if you're just curious and want to take a look. On this web page, we have lots of different communities uh, that students can indicate an interest in and find information about. So there's over 25 industry communities. So if someone is in nursing, they can go to that page and find resources that are specifically tailored to the nursing students. They can find jobs that are nursing related and blog articles, really everything that's tailored around that industry. The uh, identity and affinity communities are also really helpful resources that we can put specific information for um, students who identify in, in specific ways. So it may be that your student is an athlete. There's an affinity group for that. You have an affinity group for students of color or transfer students or students with disabilities. 
again, when students sign into the website at the top, they can select any of these in industries or, or communities of interest, and their newsletter will have more information tailored to those particular uh, subsets. So it's, it's a really great resource. Another resource I wanted to quickly mention, because I think it's often overlooked, uh, it's called Career Shift. This is a resource that we actually purchased so that Penn students can use it. And it's great. You can go in and search for jobs. You can make a list of, let's say, pharmaceutical companies in New Jersey if you want to do some research that way. You can find specific contacts. So maybe you want to find out who the marketing director at Merck is. You could go in and you could do that with Career Shift. It's really an amazing tool that draws on publicly uh, data that's publicly curated. But one of the things I wanted to mention is that Career Shift has uh, put together a resource for COVID-19 hiring. So if a student is interested in what specific, specific employers are hiring still during COVID-19, they could check this list and it will give them an idea of uh, who is hiring and who may have a hiring freeze. It looks like this when you go into it. So uh, an interesting resource. The other thing you can do with Career Shift is you can search for jobs. Again, these are not jobs that are specifically posted to Penn because those would be on our Handshake job board, which I'll talk about in a minute, but jobs that are pulled from company websites. You could do, a, again, a really quick search by industry, location, a combination of the two. There is an option here as well that they can click search remote work if they're looking for remote opportunities, which seems like that may be something that's going to be happening at least for the foreseeable future. Um, and there's also a, if you do the advanced search, you can search for employers who sponsor for H-1Bs, and that can be really helpful to our international students. And of course, we have a really great social media uh, program, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the right word. We have a lot of information that we put out on Instagram, Twitter. Um, Michael DeAngelis, our digital resources manager, and Neelan Kirshner do a podcast usually every week. Uh, you can subscribe to that, and that is a really great overview, typically about kind of what's going on in the office in any given week, but it often has a focus on a particular topic, like preparing for a career fair or how to make the most of your summer break. Um, really great. If you, if you want to get a sense of the kind of things that our office does, that can be a really wonderful resource. And, of course, Facebook. And then on the right, you'll see our blog. We have lots of things on our blog right now. We have summer students summer students who were funded for summer internships through our office are posting blogs about what they did. So you'll see a lot of that now, but you'll also see all kinds of other things that the staff writes as well. And the CS Radio podcast is always posted there as well. So I want to move along here to the kind of work that we do to connect our students with employers. We think that is really a important part of our job as well. We know that our students are, uh, very attractive to employers, and we, we want to make as many of those connections as possible. We do that in a variety of ways. Uh, the first would be our on-campus interviewing program. That is where students would apply for jobs in Handshake. Then they would employers would review the resumes and select who they want to interview. The uh, students are then can sign up for an interview slot if they're selected, and typically they would come to our on-campus interviewing suite and have an in-person interview. Obviously, that's not happening this year. It's, it's virtual. So the process for applying and signing up is the same. But then in the handshake system, the employer will put a link in there just to help the student, tell the student how to connect for the actual interview. One thing I want to mention about on-campus interviewing is even before the pandemic, this was something that has been uh, really reduced in prominence in the last, I would say, five to ten years. Many employers were using virtual processes instead of live interviews in our recruiting suite during the past few years. Uh, lots of the financial firms, for example, are using HireVue, which is an asynchronous interviewing tool where students are granted an interview. But what it is is a link to do an asynchronous video where you answer some questions and the employer watches it at their convenience. Um, if they like you, then they, they would bring you to their office for a full final round interview. So I think on campus, we used to have like 14,000 on campus interviews and 400 employers. That has been reduced a lot in the last five years at Penn and, and everywhere else. I anticipate that given the pandemic, now all employers are using virtual processes, that this will not probably spring back uh, 
fully next year because I think employers are going to like the fact that they, they don't have to travel for interviews. Um, it's not a bad thing. In some ways, virtual is, is convenient for students. They don't have to do as much travel and, um, you know, it's easy, but it is, it is a change probably from when many of you were in college. We also have a lot of employer presentations. Again, last year we had almost 200 where employers came to Penn and met with students individually in group sessions. Those are all virtual this year as well. Because we have so many in September, we decided to only publicize events that were Penn specific in September. So if an employer wanted to connect just with Penn students, we were happy to approve that. And we had over 150 of them in September. That being said, because it's easy to invite lots of students at lots of schools, we are getting many, many, many uh, opportunities for our students to connect with employers all over the country. Um, we have a, so for October and moving forward, we are approving really any sessions that we think our students might be interested in, whether it's Penn specific or not. So in October, for example, we've had 250 that we've approved already. It's a little bit of a double-edged sword because on the one hand, it's great that students have so many opportunities. On the other hand, it's, it's frankly a little overwhelming because there's so many of them. But it'll be interesting to see how this plays out again once the pandemic ends and, and see if employers want to return back to live formats or if they stay with a virtual. And then finally, we have career fairs every year. Last year, we did 13 of them. This year, again, they're virtual. We are using the Handshake platform, which is brand new in terms of virtual career fairs, and we are really happy with it. It's great that we are able to use a system that our employers and our students were already using. Uh, we've had a number, and I'll show you in a minute the stats from this fall, but when students go in, they can schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings that are 10 minutes with employers on this platform. And employers can also set up group sessions, which are kind of like the information sessions, where uh, if, if an employer is doing it through the Handshake platform, they can have 50 students at a time. If an employer wants to open it up more widely, they can put in a Zoom or a BlueJeans link, and that can be really helpful to uh let them use their own platform. But you can see in September, we had five days of career fairs. A career fire was focused on finance, insurance, and real estate. Career link is mostly business that is non-finance, but there's also some education and um, nonprofits. There's, it's a little bit, it's probably our broadest career fair in the fall. We have two days of engineering career days because we have lots of tech firms that tend to want to come and recruit our students. And then we had a policy and government fair. So in total, we had 178 employers that participated in those fairs in September. Um, we had uh, over 3,000 students that actually signed up for sessions, over 5,500 of those one-to-one 10-minute -one sessions, and 284 group sessions. So lots of uh, robust activity. Um, I would say employer activity is, is down this year somewhat. Normally, we would probably have about another 40% more employers if they were live. It's a little unclear whether employers were hesitant to use a virtual format, or I think more likely they're not really sure what their hiring needs are this year. Things are kind of up in the air. So we were happy with how these went, although the numbers we, we had wished would be a little bit higher, but I think it's a, a sign of the economy right now. We are going to have our biggest career fair in the fall uh, next week. That's going to be our STEM fair. We have over 60 employers signed up for that. And then we'll have Nursing Career Day in December. And then we will hold a, additional virtual events in the spring. We are still trying to figure out the industry breakdown, whether we want kind of more general ones or more niche-focused ones. But we will uh, absolutely be holding those uh, probably starting in February and, and into the spring, maybe at the end of January. And this is just to give you an idea of the kind of employers that recruit our students. Last year, we had over 640 different employers come to Penn to recruit Penn students. Uh, many of them did multiple things. So, for example, McKinsey might do on-campus interviewing and an information session and attend a career fair. Uh, that would only count as one employer. But lots of big names across a range of, of industries. I mean, David and Merck, more in the healthcare, um, Accenture, consulting, Cigna and insurance, Airbnb and tech, Amazon and tech. So lots of different opportunities for students. And I wanted to put a quick plug in here for parents uh, because you will probably many of you work as well and you may have a need to hire individuals where you work. 
We absolutely want to be a place that you think of when you're looking for talent. Uh, if you have to, if you're interested in hiring a current Penn student or an alum, you can easily post that job on the Handshake job board. It's free and it's very easy to do. If you want to do something a little bit more involved, like interview students through the virtual on-campus interviewing or hosting an information session, attending a career fair, we are happy to help you set up those as well. You know, we have amazing students here and uh, we'd love to help you connect with them. We do have an employer channel on our website. You can see it here, or you can just go to the website and click on employers and you will see all of this information. So to switch over a little bit, I just wanted to make sure I talked a bit about Handshake because uh, Handshake is our main portal that your student will definitely want to be in there and looking at it. Um, through Handshake, students can schedule appointments with either the um, professional advisors in our office or the peer career assistants. They can see our career fairs and all of those employer events, workshops. They can apply for jobs and internships. They can participate in on-campus interviewing. So all of those things are done through Handshake. There are a lot of jobs that are posted on Handshake. Uh, last year, we had over 60,000 full-time jobs and 23,000 internships that were posted there. Um, students can filter based on flash year or uh, industry location, lots of different ways to filter to get through that, but it's definitely the first place that they should be looking if they're thinking about opportunities. I'm going to switch over a little bit to talk about the outcomes that our students have, which are, are generally really positive. Our students tend to gravitate towards some specific well-trodden paths. <laughs> uh, lots of our students, for as long as I've been at Penn, have gone into finance, consulting, and technology. They tend to be the most popular areas. One of the reasons for that is because those kind of employers tend to be really aggressive about recruiting our students. They do things like come to campus for information sessions and participate in career fairs. They also have really cyclical hiring. So, uh, for example, in finance, typically people will be hired for two, two years as a financial analyst, and then often people will move on to other opportunities, so they need a new crop of financial analysts that will be joining them. So it's pretty predictable, and they need people every year, and they spend a lot of time and effort to recruiting our students. They also do it early in the year, typically, so that's another reason why we see our students tending to go into those fields, because they may get those offers in September, whereas if you're looking at fields like entertainment or nonprofit, those kind of places are probably not going to recruit until much later in the year. Our students also tend to be bi-coastal. I will show you in a minute. We have lots of people on the West Coast, lots of people on the East Coast, a few people in Chicago, and not so much in between. <laughs> um, we have opportunities, again, on Handshake from all over, but we, we tend to be fairly East and West Coast uh, driven. We believe as an office that your major can be your career. It could be very related, but it doesn't have to be. So for example, um, if you are a computer science student and you want to be a sophomore engineer, go to it. That makes perfect sense. On the other hand, we have uh, people who go into consulting from all of our industries. They, they are in engineering and they are in um, Wharton and they are in the arts and sciences. So the skill set is important, but the specific major may be less important. We think that majors are, are not the delimiting factor, but rather the skills that you bring to the table and your ability to articulate those skills are really what's most important. Our professional association, the National Association of Colleges and Employers, does a survey every year of employers to ask what things are most important when they're recruiting college students. And you can see pretty consistently the ones on top are relatively general skills that most of our students would have critical thinking and problem solving, teamwork and collaboration, professionalism and a work ethic, and oral written communications. All of those things are super important and they're not tied to a specific major. You could be in any major and demonstrate these skills. So we think our job is really helping students think about those skills, think about how they want to apply them, what industry, and be able to communicate that to an employer in the resume and in the cover letter and certainly in the interview. And uh, we spend a lot of time working individually with students to help them uh, articulate what it is they want to do and why they are well qualified for it. A little bit about trends. Uh, probably these will not surprise many of you, but many large employers are hiring interns 
that could then convert to full-time staff. So internships are super important. Um, a lot of employers are doing it earlier. We started internship recruiting this year on September 22nd, the same day we started full-time recruiting. So particularly for juniors who are very heavily recruited for internships, um, they're gonna wanna be definitely looking at that in the fall for particular industries. Other industries that are a little less cyclical may certainly hire in the spring or smaller employers who may not be looking to convert to full-time. Um, but in general, there are lots of the big employers tend to, go, to recruit in the fall. Um, as I mentioned, more employ employers are using technology in the hiring process, uh, such as HireVue, that asynchronous interviewing tool that I mentioned, or Pymetrics, which is a assessment platform that's sort of game-based to assess students. Um, there may be coding challenges that computer science students will need to do. So lots of technology use right from the get-go with finding jobs, but also applying for them and, and showing that you're qualified for them. Most of our students are doing uh, multiple internships. Almost all of our students do at least one and many do two or sometimes even three. So um, definitely a focus on getting that experiential education. So here's information I'll, I'll go quickly. It's from the class of 2019 and I'm apologizing a little bit because typically at family weekend, we would present some presumably preliminary stats from the class that just graduated, um, which would be the class of 2020. Honestly, it's been really hard to, to get as much data as, as we normally have from the class this early because they weren't on campus in the spring and it's been hard to, to follow up with them. We are absolutely doing that, but our numbers are not quite where we wanted to be to present it. So we're, we're still trying to get our response rate up. That being said, our numbers don't tend to change dramatic, dramatically year to year. I think if we were to look at the class of 2018, 17, 19, you would see similar results. Um, we may have a higher still seeking rate this year. It would not surprise me because we're in a difficult economy, but I think it's not going to be terrible. Um, you know, I, I, we're hearing lots of students who have been able to find offers. Um, we just need to continue to follow up to, to get that information in our system. But anyway, for the class of 2019, you can see that 77% went right into work and another 14% went on for continuing education. Uh, we do find that a lot of our students want to take a gap year or two, so they'll work for a little bit and then they'll go back to law school or some other kind of even med school, grad school. When we closed the survey six months after graduation, 5% were still seeking employment and another 4% were doing other things like uh, part-time employment or uh, volunteering, that sort of thing. And the median salary was a, a very healthy 77500 Again, I mentioned that our students tend to gravitate towards a few industries broadly. Uh, financial service, consulting, and tech are the biggest, but also a significant number in healthcare. Not only our nurses, but people who are going to work for um, other allied sorts of healthcare things. Some in education, nonprofit, media. Um, and then you'll see small numbers in things like retail, marketing, um, sports, a range. So th there's a lot of opportunity open to our students. Um, but again, often people tend to go with those employers that are recruiting early in the year, I think because it's, it's safe and, and lots of them have good opportunities for students in terms of um, structured programs where they're gonna get a lot of training. And here's our geographic breakdown. Again, not surprising, lots of people in New York and Pennsylvania and California, um, and then some significant populations in Washington State, Texas, Florida, um, Chicago. So not so many in the middle, but again, we have lots of opportunities there, but that's just not where our students tend to, to wind up. And I wanted to give you an idea of the, in, employment offer timeline, because this really varies depending on what industry you are looking at. Uh, you can see lots of our students do get an offer in the fall of their senior year, over half, and they are going into those fields that are very heavily recruited in the fall, again, like finance, consulting, and technology. Most of us other industries are going to be hiring in the spring, whether it's being a legal assistant at a law firm or entertainment, healthcare, marketing. Those are going to be spread out into the spring and then certainly even into the summer once they're ready to work. So we see a whole range. If you'll look at our website, you can see our reports for the first destination surveys by school. 
You can also see our summer internship surveys by school and an overall grouping. Uh, but one report that might be particularly interesting to you is the industry reports that are available for both full-time and summer employment. And that breaks down the information by industry. So here I pulled out the page that covers engineering and manufacturing, but it will show information on when people got offers, what the salaries were like, the actual jobs that they took, the job functions within the industry, how they found the opportunity, and we have that for lots of different industry breakdowns. So if your student, for example, is wondering when are people interested in nonprofits hired, they could go to this report and it would give them an idea uh, based on the previous class when they found those opportunities. This, uh, going back to the general data from 2019, indicates how students found their offer. You can see about 43% found it through the Career Services Office. And that's a mix of on-campus interviewing senior year, it's an, uh, as well as on-campus interviewing for an internship, typically junior year, that then converted to a full-time offer, as well as things like career fairs and the Handshake Job Board. But 25% uh, applied directly. I mean, they found an opportunity and they just reached out directly. Um, that's still a great way to uh, find opportunities, and we are not connected with every employer out there, so we definitely encourage students to be proactive as well. Um, some other students converted an intern that they did not get from our office uh, into a full-time job. Networking, still important. We had 7% who net found it through a non-pen contact and 7% through a pen contact, and then other ways. But you can see there's a range of ways to find opportunities, and we encourage to students to take advantage of all of them because that's probably the smartest way to job search. And here I'll just leave this slide up for a couple of seconds. It shows the top employers of Penn students in, in, by each industry. And you can see we have lots of big names. Um, you know, NBC Universal, McKinsey, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Facebook. Lots of places that our students are really excited to work. And then here is a, a quick slide on continuing education. This is the 14% of the class of 2019 who enrolled in continuing education. Um, it might surprise you that engineering is the top field of study. That um, Most of those students are doing an undergraduate engineering degree at Penn and some matriculating to get a master's. So lots of our engineering students opt to do that. But then medicine, social science, the law, Seems a little bit low, but that's probably because lots of people who are going to law school go take a few years off for So they're not showing up on this first destination survey because they're probably working as their first destination and going to law school later. So with that, I want to end and uh, we'll perhaps take some questions. I want to make sure that you know that we are here to help. We have a large staff. We love working with your students and all they need to do is to schedule an appointment on Handshake to come in and talk to us. Um, we really are here to be a resource for them and we absolutely enjoy working with them. Let me switch back over here. All right, Claire, do we have any questions? So most of the questions have come in through the chat and the Q&A, so no additional new questions at the moment. There's been some questions about, I'll turn my screen on, there's been some questions about engaging in clinical opportunities. Uh, people wanted to know if this presentation would be recorded and put out, um, and that that is absolutely the case. Um, Additionally, questions about international opportunities. So Jamie and I were sharing some information about going global and Uniworld, but uh, fairly fairly slow on the on the question front so far. So people should not be shy about putting questions forward if they have additional ones. Absolutely. And if we don't have other ones, we could certainly end it here as well. We'll give a couple more minutes just to see if um, anybody asks.
I mean, I guess a question that I can ask you, Barb, is I know, you know, one of the things we normally get asked by parents during Parents Weekend is sort of what can students be doing in their first semester at Penn? What, what can first years be doing in their either first semester or their first year to, to be successful from a career perspective? That's a great question. And I think um, Penn is a very pre-professional place. So students often feel like they have to jump in and have like the most well-known structured internship ever during freshman year, and that is not true. What I would say um, for freshmen, first off, you want to do well academically at your pen, so make sure that you're putting enough time into your classes, building connections with faculty, and doing well academically. The other thing I would say, and I realize it's, it's somewhat difficult to do this year, but try to get involved in activities and clubs, those opportunities to meet other people, to take on eventually leadership roles, those are super helpful. And I know that lots of Penn's clubs are uh, doing virtual recruitment and trying to hold virtual meetings. You know, it's it's not the same as what it would be in person, but if you can get involved with some of those, that would be great. For the summer of freshman year, I would say um, be really flexible. Our freshman year, internships are important, but you don't necessarily have to do one freshman year. Um, we do find lots of students who do internships, typically with smaller places that are more or, or less structured than the big places, and they places that don't care so much about converting their interns to full-time employees, lots of those opportunities will show up later in the spring on Handshake. Um, but also, you might want to network. You know, if, if you have parents' friends or friends' parents or people in your church, really anyone you know, let them know what kind of things you're interested in. And we find that lots of our freshmen find great opportunities just by talking to people that way. So I would say look for something that's interesting, that would be fun. It does not have to be high powered. And if you wanted to do something like volunteer or take classes, travel, I would usually say, I don't know anyone's gonna wanna travel this summer, <laughs> but those kind of things are, are okay as well as a freshman. So that actually kind of answers one of the first questions that came in, which was, do you recommend that freshmen look for internships? And what percentage of sophomores get internships in engineering? I do not know that number offhand. What I, I don't know if Jamie wants to hop in here. She might have, Jamie's our engineering counselor. She might know offhand. But what I would say is if you go to our website and click on the outcomes tab, you can look at all of our summer uh, internship reports there broken down by school. So that will give you a pretty good idea of what our students are doing. Um, you know, I would say that particularly Computer science skills are really needed. <laughs> so I find lots of people with technical skills uh, are usually put to, to good use by lots of organizations because it's a very concrete skill that is sometimes hard to come by. Right. And then similarly, you know, is it common for freshman engineers to get an internship? While we're waiting to see if Jamie can can hop on to, to add any nuance, I'm going to put the link for the um, 2019 summer survey for the School of Engineering, which has the data that Barb was referencing in terms of um, that breakdown by school for anybody who's interested. So I just added that to the chat. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Hello. How are you? Hello. I was listening and, and typing as we were responding to things. Um, to Barb's point, yeah, absolutely. There are certainly programs, especially within engineering, that require a um, skill set that's built upon. So you would need to have certain demonstrable capabilities that you could show an employer. But there are also many large employers that offer programs specific to first year students or specific to second year students. They may not be all summer and they may not be, you know, necessarily highly paid or anything like that, but they're ways for students to start to learn about the industry, to get their foot in the door, um, and to really start exploring some things. And one of the interesting things I think, and what keeps me certainly excited about working with engineering students is what I describe to many of my advisees as the intersectionality between so many of their skill sets and what they will go on to pursue. So yes, tech is everywhere. What does that mean? For some people it's tech in education, for some people it's tech in healthcare, for some people it's in a startup or a large organization or a philanthropic not-for-profit approach. The skill sets are required in lots of places, but to the point that I was making in the chat, there's also a lot of employers across many, many industries, engineering of course included in that as well as technology and others, that look for those 
bigger skill sets, the communication skills, the ability to work well in teams. Those are things that students have been building. And I talk with engineers every day. I was on my Lego first robotics team in eighth grade. Well, that counts too, right? So thinking about the trajectory and the history of what's brought that student in, where there may be intersectionality between an interest industry and a skill set, and then what kinds of programs might exist. Uh, and I'm happy to share the slide deck that I prepared for our first year engineering students to search for internships. I believe it should be posted on the group's website that I gave it to, um, but I'll have a copy of it as well and I can make that available. Great. And you know what, I had one other thought um, that we have this great program at Penn that's run by our Center for Undergraduate Research and Fellowships, PERF. <laughs> they help students find research and fellowships. But they run a really great program in the summer where they hire freshmen to do research with uh, faculty mentors around campus. Typically, they have like 200 of them, and they're, they're paid opportunities across all four schools at Penn. So that might be a really great thing for um, freshmen to do as well. It lets you work with, closely with a professor. You get great research skills. You can stay on campus in the summer. <laughs> it's got a lot of benefits, but uh, be on the lookout for that. It's usually promoted. Uh, I would say late in December, and the application deadline I think usually is in early January. Is that right, Claire? That's that's right. Yes. Yeah, that's an excellent opportunity for first and second year students. We have a question from Jeanette um, who asks: Is there a letter of recommendation bank for students who may defer law school applications till after working first, then two years later they have to chase down a professor for a letter? Um, I'm presuming that's something that Carol can maybe shed light on um, and sure. actually yeah go ahead Carol yeah I, I answered Jeanette directly but if anyone else is interested the only letters that are stored at career services are the letters for medical and dental school because we have to read those if it makes sense for a student to obtain a letter and keep it for later to apply for graduate school there are Pretty inexpensive third party services, Interfolio and Private Folio are two of those that our students use, where they can store the letter and then send them out years down the road. So we can help them with that. And and while you're on, um, there's another sort of health related question that just came in. Best summer opportunities for upper class pre-med students. Um, there's a lot of variation because we have a lot of pre-meds who do a lot of different things. So the best thing is usually the thing that the student is most excited about and fits with their interests in general. So there's nothing that generically looks great for every applicant. And in fact, people who do things that they think are the best, sometimes it turns out not to be the best if they don't like it. I generally think if they have not had a summer research experience, either clinical research lab or health policy research one summer, that would be a good time to do it because it's very rewarding to do research during the summer. Um, that is also a time where many of our students, when they are able to, again, go abroad, either through study abroad or global internship program, and many of those opportunities are health related. Um, some of them don't have a lot of clinical experience by that point, even though we encourage them to get it earlier. So they will sometimes um, work as an assistant in a clinic or work as a clinical research assistant who also has contact with patients. Um, but usually by that point, the summer is one dedicated opportunity that we work with them on to identify and take. Earlier on, they might split their summer up between a lot of different things. And some of them choose to study for the MCAT that summer and take it at the end of the summer. Great, thank you. Um, question, are any particular advice for sophomores? Um, David, do you wanna jump on and take this just so we give everyone a chance to, to chat? Certainly. Thank you, David. So with sophomore year, I think it's this idea of exploration that we do encourage for our underclassmen. And typically when we look at our data, our sophomores have pursued a variety of experiences. So the first piece of advice I have is to think about things that they might be curious about that maybe they don't have as much knowledge into. And the internship and 
the summer uh, period of time is a great opportunity to explore, to learn more about their interests, better define what's important to them, so that as they proceed and move forward throughout the years, they're making decisions um, that are in their best interest and tailored to the things that are most important to them. But in the past, we've seen sophomores pursue a variety of opportunities. Um, I, I would add that sometimes there are questions about, are these opportunities at larger companies? Are they structured? And that really depends on the industry. But generally speaking, there are not as many structured uh, opportunities during the summer for sophomores. But that doesn't mean that sophomores don't pursue um, a variety of experiences. Uh, as Barb mentioned earlier, uh, because Penn is such a pre-professional place, I think there's great interest and exploration, just seeing what these opportunities look like. But in terms of variety, it's, it really mirrors a lot of the different things that we see our students end up in, in terms of full-time opportunities. So uh, sophomore year is a great time to explore, and if students are exploring their interests, I think that's the best way to spend their summer. Thank you, David. Uh, do we have stats on students who submatriculate into grad programs in their senior year? But it looks like um, maybe Carol put that into, no, that was Penn Abroad, put that into the chat. Um, do we, do we have, we, that, there are some stats about that in our, uh, in our survey reports. Um, but I don't know, Barb, you want to say anything about that in particular or Carol? I would say I'm not sure what that number is. I mean, I meet, when I'm meeting with students, I will, you know, we had a, a panel, an environmental panel we did. There was a student who submatriculated into environmental studies, or sometimes people will do a master's in English with their undergraduate in English. I think where we see it most often is with the engineering students. Um, I don't know, Carol, if you have any stats on law school, like how many submatrics we have with the law program. I'm just not no. sure. Not on the top of my head. I would have to ask one of the pre-law advisors, Mia or Ariana. It's not a lot. Um, and we don't meet with every student who submatriculates, but I think you could get an idea if you looked at the, the reports, the career outcome reports, and see what grad programs people were entering after graduation. If public health at Penn or biotechnology or uh, decision, you know, data science and decision making, you would be able to identify those as submetric programs in most cases. I absolutely agree with you, Carol. I think that submatriculation, or now that I think they're calling it accelerated masters at the engineering school, um, the rules have changed around that, especially as they pertain to financial aid in the last couple of years. So the number has fluctuated a little bit, but it is very common, especially for engineering students and even for students outside of C's to submatriculate into master's programs uh, within the School of Engineering and Applied Science. And technically, my team works with uh, engineering master's candidates as well. So we see a lot of those students move through our office and work with our team for the entire time that they're at Penn. Yeah, agreed. Um, I just want to weigh in on something that's kind of happening um, in, in the chat here and a sort of uh, a, a misconception that we have all the time. And as the person who heads up the team working with undergrads in arts and sciences, you know, I love working with students in the college and I feel really strongly in the value of a liberal arts education and that our students are incredibly successful regardless of what they want to do and that our mission in, her, in our office is to support our students regardless of their career interests. We have so many resources in so many different industries, and we hear all the time because of the popularity of things like consulting and finance, which are equally popular among college students as they are among the, the other schools, that um, you know, there aren't as many services for, for students in the college or somehow you know, they're, they're less well prepared to, or less well sought after by employers. And, and that's just not true. Um, and, you know, we work really hard to combat that, that misconception, but also we have lots of resources and programs specifically for college students. There's a college alumni mentoring series 
where we bring in alums from the college, you know, who work in different industries. Uh, we rotate out what those industries are. We had a panel a couple of weeks ago on careers in health where we ha- where we did this um, not during a pandemic. That would be over a, a meal in person where students have an opportunity to have roundtable, you know, discussions with those alums. Right now, we're doing that virtually with breakout rooms over Zoom, but they're still happening. Um, a few weeks before uh, that, it was environmentally focused. And in another couple of weeks, we're going to be doing one on um, politics, given the, the sort of timing of the election and working with, with, with alums who are in politics and public policy. So we absolutely, you know, highlight things in different areas. We also have a mentoring platform called Ben Connect that's specifically to connect college you know, students with college alums in that in areas of interest. I just met with a student last week who was talking about how this is such a great platform. He was able to connect with an alum who works in the MBA and another alum who works at Discovery and how great those conversations have been in terms of helping him, you know, advance his career objectives. We have loads of alums in entertainment who are really happy to come back and talk about their experience and are proud college alums. We have a career readiness series that's happening um, next weekend for students in the college, where, again, we're featuring great alums across a range of industries. Laura Alber, who is the CEO of um, Williams-Sonoma, is going to be our featured kickoff speaker. But there there are alums across a range of industries. So as Michael said, it's just not true that we don't have both programming and resources to support students across a range of industries. And whatever their their interest may be, we want to prepare them for success. And we believe strongly that they will be successful because that's what the data shows. And Claire, on that, I think we are up to the hour, but that is a great way to end. <laughs> so, uh, we want to work with your students regardless of whatever their interest is um, or what they want to do, or even if they have no idea what they want to do, that's okay yeah. too. Um, have them come in. We're, we're divided into teams so that we can get to know our students and know the curriculums in the school. Um, it just helps with that one-on-one connection, but all of the services are open to all of our students. There's really not uh, a lot of disparity between what a student in engineering might have versus warden or nursing or college. So we want to serve all our students, and we know that um, they're incredible. All Penn students are incredible, and we feel very privileged to work with them. So with that, I will thank you for coming, and uh, please do have your students schedule an appointment with us, and certainly take a look at the website, because there's all kinds of resources there that, that is just a wealth of information. Happy Friday, and enjoy the weekend.